works that says we are saved by God's grace, not by our accomplishments. By all means, do accomplishments, but that's not what saves us. Also, another one was a kingdom upside down. We had fun with this because, uh, sadly, we live in a world where we have to be kind of upside down. We have to be the odd man out, basically. Otherwise, we look like the world, and people can't tell what's a Christian versus what's, what's a worldly man. So, yes, do the best you can to be upside down because, actually, the world is upside down. We are the whatever the opposite of that is. Uh, also, we did let your light shine, and you know the song, my little light. <laughs> and um, it means to be a real witness for God, both in action, maybe that's first, and then in word, or both at the same time. Uh, also, carry me tenderly, meaning God is holding us. We know, all know the story of the footprints in the sand, when at one point there are two pairs of footprints, and at another point, when the person goes through the hard of trials, there's only one pair. That's where God is carrying us. He always, and he, even when he disciplines us, he does it in love, not to destroy us, but it's actually to help us recover and, and repent. Also, help me to forgive, sort of a follow-up of that. We all know the Lord's Prayer, part of it. In there it says, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those that trespasses against us. We need to learn to do that, which is not that easy. Um, it's easy to pretend others to ask forgiveness from us, but it's harder to ask for us to ask forgiveness from them. A godly friend, so important, especially for the younger one, but that's much for the old, um, the older ones too. Um, the importance of having friends that encourage you to grow in the knowledge of Christ, in the knowledge of God rather than pulling you down. We already have two horrible enemies, the devil and then the sinful spirit, and it's a high competition who is worse. We don't need any more help from other friends that instead of helping us, they tear us down. So look for the best friends you can possibly find, especially in the Christian community. And the last one we did, um, I always marvel at that, at the name of Jesus, it's amazing the power from a young man like here to the oldest. Who is the oldest here? No, never mind that question. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have such a tremendous power. We have the Holy Spirit. We can accomplish so much. We're not talking about some uh, spectacular miracle uh, here. I'm healing all the sick. That's God's uh, will, wherever he wants to accomplish that. But the power to overcome our own temptations, the sins, we can live actually what uh, Paul called a wholesome, abundant, above all, a, 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 real, a real Christian life. And he can do it, and I should do it, because I expect him to do it, so maybe I should do it first. Um, okay, so as in the past, th that's some of the topics we studied. And again, the wonderful part is that... Uh, I learn as much as they learn. And sometimes I feel guilty because I need to teach them the lesson which I know, but I also know Alex put it in practice too, so at least the things you say would have a little more power. The last thing I wanna be, it's what that verse says, some people have the, how is that verse? Putere fere blavi, I know it in Romanian. Uh, they have a form of power but without uh, form of uh, godliness but without the power of God. I kind of switched it. Anyway, I want to, we all need to try to be real active Christians in that sense. So, as in the past, we want to reward the ones who perform well through the year, completing the daily devotions, participating each week, and most of them did uh, fine. Um, we started actually since last year to have what we call the participation awards. Because it's not that easy. Things happen every Wednesday. We have uh, memory backup verses in case somebody is sick or gone on vacation. But participation is important in order to have an active club. And um, so we have these participation awards. And I'm going to call for the ladies first, uh, girls, Galina Macon. So come on over. Uh, Aurora 
Litke. I apologize for my pronunciation. I can barely pronounce my own name. Okay. Um, and Susan Jaquith. Susan. Okay, there we go. And for the boys, we have Kemuel Knezevich. Um, uh, stop with uh. Okay. We have Daniel Olson. And we also have Ethan Lara. I'll, we'll give that to him on Wednesday. Um, good. Um, by the way, all of this participation, they barely missed the next level. And that is um, the Faithful Awards, the yearly Faithful Awards. This is given to each sailor who completes an entire year in Patch the Pirate Club. That means three trimesters, which means nine months total. And for that, for the ladies, we have Joanna Burley. And you have a pin in there, which you can put it on your hat later on. Jessica Burley. Uh, by the way, they are sisters, if in case. <laughs> Julia Garou. And Anna Olson. For the boys, we have uh, Dimitri Macon and Jacob Moore. Now, some of them barely missed the next level of the award, which is supposedly the highest. The Super Sailor Award, this is for those who are consistent in their testimony, diligence, and that giving spirit. Now, this year, more than ever before, we had a huge problem. Uh, in the past, we used to be one girl and one boy. Um, and we've done four years like that. Now I have two boys and two girls, each in each category with the same score. Next time I'll be more ready to have more than two medals. So for now, we're going to have four super sailors. I have only two medals. I ordered already two more, which are coming maybe in a week. I'll talk to the pastor maybe one evening if I can have one minute to reward them at that time. I'll give them the diploma to all four of them. Uh, one it's yeah, we'll do that. One, we have Joanna Burley. And do we have a medal? Okay. Now. Don't be fooled by her shyness. She's not. She's like, uh, I try to find out what she's like. And the best it comes out, okay, um, I'm not trying to be funny. That's what I'm, she's like a volcano. Quiet most of the time, but then she exploding with speed and action. Watch her play soccer. She plays, by the way, pretty good. Or any other outdoor game that involves running. For anyone that want to compete against her, God have mercy on your soul. You'll lose. Okay? So that's Joanna. I don't know how she does that. Anyway. Um, the, next, um, the next one we have, uh, I'll do a split for now. Jacob Moore. Since I have only two medals, I'll, I'll explain in a second. Okay? Uh, he's... Uh, always very diligent, committed to the club, respectful. He's more mature than his age. Um, I remember my youngest, Michael, okay, he always learned everything faster than anybody else because he learned from Matthew and Philip, older sons, better in basketball, better in even in school. He had enough of, oh, oh, I'm the youngest too, so maybe that's why I'm so smart. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Anyway, enough about me. Okay. Um, the next one for the girls, we have uh, Anna Olson for the super sailor. Anna Olson. Okay, and we'll, once the medal comes in, we'll give you that too. And for the boys, I have Dimitri Macon. So that was my problem this year. They've done so well. I felt it's almost unfair. Literally, I had to flip a coin. And I don't want to do that. Because it's kind of discouraging 
one loses just because of a flip a coin. In soccer, we have when in a, it's a tie, penalty kicks, and everybody hates it because both teams play very, very well, and one loses because one missed penalty. So uh, not, that's not even the case because nobody missed even a penalty. They did all well. So I'm glad to have this problem. May all of you be super sailor next year, and I'll bring more medals if I have to. All right. So now we have graduation. Um, what's the first one? I think I just gave Joanna. Yeah. Okay. So we have Joanna. She's no the graduation. It's a gift. I know. I just gave the gift. Oh, you did. Okay. Sorry. Uh, next one. Which one is it? Anna. So uh, these girls that I'm calling now, uh, they graduated. Too bad because I'm losing very important participants. Uh, next one is Aurora. Aurora. I'm still pushing to have my patch up to the 12th grade, but uh, I tried for 15 years and it doesn't work. The next is Jacob also. Uh, I'm expecting new third graders in two weeks. Keep them coming, please. Otherwise, I lose my job. I don't know. I hope not. Um, now, we also have a treasure box. We raised money throughout the year, and we like to dedicate that to Derek and Julia Thomas. Thomas. Uh, missionaries in Ukraine. I'm terrible with names. You are Matt Moore, right? I think so. Yeah. All right. Now, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, it's a million dollars or something like that or something. Yeah. Okay. So whatever we raised, uh, we did the best we can. We're trying to encourage the kids to even a, a quarter if they bring a week, it's fine. It's not a, as much the amount as the heart behind it. For credits now, because why is this happening is, first I want to thank my wife, Doriana, taking care of all the details, which I'm very terrible at. Uh, and I truly appreciate her patience and her advice, especially when I keep on preaching and these kids are glazy eyes and she goes in the back and tells me to cut it off. So after 10 minutes, then I cut it off, of course. Uh, so many thanks to you, Dori. Thank you again. Uh, many thanks to my co-captains. Uh, Matt and Hannah Moore, with their contribution, you see them, they direct the music, piano playing, activities, even some of the girls in the summer, I heard they're going to help me with games, which I'm pretty terrible at it, but they have great ideas for those summer activities. Great thanks to the parents for bringing them in. Um, we don't want to do just babysitting, we want to teach them as we learn from it, like I said before. Thank you for encouraging them to do their devotions. And even if some of them miss here and there, I appreciate when the parents are working with their children to encourage to, to build that habit. Once they build this habit, it's, it's going to go a, a lifelong. Uh, and of course, the church leadership for allowing this program to happen. Not many churches have a, a children program like this. And it's not just to keep me and Matt and Hannah and my wife Dori busy. We are learning. I, I'm so glad. I, God has been working in my heart through all these years to keep me accountable. Human nature as it is will find something to be busy. Now, if we are busy in his activities, hopefully we're going to learn to do you know, his will in our lives. So again, thank you for everyone. Uh, pray for them as the graduating class goes to the next one. Be nice to those older Guys, especially your Twin Towers brothers, Jacob, don't be ugly with them. Be nice. So, yeah, keep praying, them, uh, keep praying for them as they grow continuously because it doesn't stop in here. You will stop, I don't know, when you die of old age or something like that. Until then, keep on going. Thank you.
Amen. Thanks, fellas. Thank you, youngins. I guess they're uh, in another room now. Good evening. I'm glad you could be here. I'm glad I'm here. Um, let's, uh, let's begin our song service, our part, uh, with uh, some singing. Faithful man, let's stand as we sing this together, our theme chorus. If you need your hymnal number 127, Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that I'm my Father in heaven. Tells of his love in the book. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the news that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. And we'll remain standing for opening prayer. We want to remember as we start this evening, Beth Guthrie, uh, she's home from the hospital, but we continue to pray for her. And this one in our school who requested prayer for his mom who took a recent fall, Tristan's mom. So let's pray for them as we get started this evening. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these young ones and their heart and their singing, their preparation, their diligence, their work. Thank you for the Papascus and the Moors that work diligently and faithfully with them, instilling these Christ-like, godly principles into their lives. Lord, we pray that that would have a permanent, ongoing effect that they can reflect upon in years to come. Lord, we do pray for Bev Guthrie, Lord, that you continue to give her grace. Thank you that she's home from the hospital, but please strengthen her body, grant full healing. Just go before her. And we think of this one in our school who requested prayer for his mom, a full recovery for Tristan's mom. We pray for her that you would help her not to have any long-term injuries as a result of a fall that she took recently, but give her grace. And then, Lord, as we sing and learn from your word tonight, may we have ready hearts to apply to our hearts what we hear from your word. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to sing together number 123, Come Unto Me. <clears throat> Jesus, my Savior, is calling to me. Come, child, your struggle is done. He bore my burden on Calvary's tree. Gladly I rest in God's Son. Come on.
for prayer as we receive our evening offering. Dear Lord, this evening we're thankful that we can come unto you, Lord, and that you will give us rest. And as, as we heard earlier, that you're everything that we need, Lord, and we do. We pray that you would bless us this evening, bless these offerings that we give, and we do pray a special blessing on all these young people, Lord, and all their work. We pray that they would continue to grow and in, in your grace and, and learn more about you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for that wonderful offertory. Let's sing together, O oh, Great God. So we're going to go through announcements this evening with what is called subliminal stimulation. That means they're going to go so fast, if you don't catch them, only your brain will. They used to do that in a study with Coca-Cola. And uh, I have some things to say about Coca-Cola, but not tonight. Um, so uh, here we go. Are you ready? Outreach. Forms. No forms. Uh, box at table. There is a box at the table. Um, tracking progress. See, it's going so fast you can't see them. That's the, that's the deal. Okay, good job up there. All right, great job. Past performance, hey, great job. Great job. Big thank you to the Popescus and the Moors, and your awards are coming. It, it involves medals. Yeah, crowns at, yeah, at the feet of Jesus, yeah. Yeah, it, the medal is uh, flew under the, 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 the pulpit extension here a bit ago. We got to find it. So um, actually, thank you for that offering to the Derek Thomas family. They are a worthy family, and they are uh, doing a great work there with the Ministry of Compassion for Ukraine. And uh, since we spilled the, the money there, uh, there was a good offering. I didn't count it real quick, but um, it's, a, it's a blessing. Thank you, young folks. So this coming week, evangelist Rob Watkins is coming in, and uh, you will enjoy his being with us. Keep in mind, next Sunday, uh, we're looking forward to some special events. But before Sunday comes Saturday, personal invitations. Can I put you on the spot? How many either have or will purpose to try to get out one of these to somebody before Saturday you have or will per to really try to? Listen, if you really get stuck, give me one. I'll come. Okay. So we'll look forward to that at 1 o'clock. And that's not just for kids. It's for kids at heart. How many of you older people, older as in post-20? All right. Your kids at heart. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we're looking forward as well to our baptismal service. It was it was fun. It always is. Uh, this afternoon, the, uh, after the morning service, 
uh, to take those being baptized up to the baptistry, kind of show them how that's going to work, and so they're not apprehensive, and and um, and so it'll it'll be it'll be great, and rejoice with them, and we'll try to get some pictures of them. If you're a very special friend of theirs, uh, come up and get a picture uh, there after the baptism, and and uh, we'll send them electronic all those pictures, and they'll they'll enjoy those. So that'll be our baptismal service. Then father-son campout, strawberry fellowship, neighborhood Bible time, 4th of July picnic, concealed handgun license class. You got it all. Thank you. We'll look forward to all of these upcoming events. And again, thank you, Patch Kids, young folk, for the wonderful performance this evening. What a blessing that was. Well, Brother uh, Popescu, Thank you for the right side up themes. I know it seems like we're the ones that are upside down, but thank you for turning it right side up. In fact, that's why I sit here in the auditorium. It's the right side. So um, my group is kind of small tonight. I know somebody had a, an activity this afternoon. I'm just kidding over here. You, you, just kidding. Just kidding. So... Um, we're going to sing again. Brother Stuck, do you want him to stand, guard my heart, hymn number 125? Let's sing that. And then Brother Guru, this is your night. Thank you for working with our young folks and the varied ways in what you do. And the way I see it, everybody over here, you are on the right side. Let's stand. It's all how you look at it. It's all how you look at it. Number 125 in your hymnal if you need it. Guard my heart. Two times, please. Please be seated. All right, well, good evening tonight. Uh, I've got a message entitled for you. The title happens to be The uh, Serious Health Effects of Coke on the Body. So, <laughs> point number one, the left coast. Point number two is, what's that, uh, what's the name of that, uh, that stuffed animal, barbecue bear chubs. Is that it? Bear chops, that's it, barbecue bear chops. So I have a habit of preaching right after the, uh, the patch group gets up here, and so there's a reason for that. And so uh, just sign me up for the next few years for that. I've got to preach really fast tonight, Exodus chapter number 2. If you can't find Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, there you found it. Exodus chapter 2. I don't want to just be funny tonight, but I want to say something about Brother Rob Watkins. Brother Rob Watkins is a friend of mine. He is two people in one. You get what I'm saying there? So if you come for one show, one person, you get double. Because not only does he speak, but he has character speak. At 1 o'clock on Saturday, if you'll come in a few minutes before 1, you can get a chance to spin wheel, get a prize, and walk away with a piece of candy or something like that. But you can come at 1 o'clock and just flood this room. I don't want him to come and put hours. He'll put his whole stage up here. He hides behind the stage. He brings out his tricks. He brings out his illusions. I don't want him to come and just have maybe a half-empty room. 
I know you're busy, it's graduation weekend, but could I just say that you'll get two for the price of one? In fact, he'll bring out eight characters. He'll preach the gospel, he'll do all these things. He's enlightening, he's encouraging. He's, all you have to do is just come and sit in the seat and listen and be entertained. And so be praying for him, and that is a wonderful thing. I understand if you can't come. Um, it's okay. It's for adults. It's for the community. And uh, I'm just going to go get, I know I have some neighbors that almost shut-ins, but they'll enjoy seeing this flyer right here. I'm going to go and just hit my neighborhood with these. And uh, so this week, but uh, let me see a couple other things. So that's what I want to say at the beginning of the message here. I'm going to have to preach real fast. So subliminally, just think about this and uh, you won't miss anything here tonight. I know it'll be a blessing to you. And uh, I'm just kind of going off of what I learned from announcements tonight. Just going to keep, keep the ball rolling. Got to keep you awake tonight. A little boy, he was in Sunday school class, and the teacher came up to him and said, teacher, came, bow your heads, close your eyes, and, and uh, he said some, uh, the teacher said something to the effect of, um, now, how many of you boys and girls would like to be on your way to heaven? And everyone raised their hand except for one little boy. And uh, then the teacher had the class look up, and she says, boy, yeah. There's Johnny, don't you want to go to heaven one day? Wouldn't you like to? Everyone else raised their hand. He said, oh, I'd like to go to heaven, but I just thought you were getting a load to go up now. <laughs> and so, I don't want to go now. Anyway, so that was the joke of this evening. I'll preach fast, but if I don't run out of time, I may make it part two, because there's a lot to it, but it's the simple. It's something that's very simple. Something that when we see the simplicity of the Word of God, if we'll just believe it, we'll read it, we'll believe it, we'll do it, we'll obey it, Everything, why do we make the Christian life so complicated? Well, there's trials, there's this, there's that, and there's things. And so as we see this, I ran into something simple in Exodus chapter 2, and you probably know where I'm going with this message. I have a couple of the messages I've been working on, and uh, I want to preach these titles one of these days. Let's do lunch, The Valley Forges of Life, Lord, If Thou Wilt, Thou Canst, What God Says, and I have about 50 titles that aren't just catchy titles. They're things that I've been working on, I've been praying about, I've been thinking about. But this one came up tonight. And I don't know why this subject or this topic, but I think it'll be fitting for us tonight. Exodus chapter number 2. Let me say a little bit, before we go to the Lord in prayer and have the opening illustration, let me say a little bit about what's going on in Exodus chapter number 2. Exodus chapter 2, we see the birth of Moses. We see his going through... And his life and how his mom raises him. And three months later, he's in a basket in the river and then he's being raised. And how about if your life was in one chapter of the Bible? How about if your life, we said your life in one chapter? That would be really quick, wouldn't it? And then we come to Exodus chapter 2. God was getting a Moses prepared. He was getting a person prepared. He was telling about the story of Moses. But then he wanted to say, set the scene and say what was going on with the children of Israel at that time. The children of Israel may have not been led out of Egypt if there was not a Moses. But look with me in verse number. So I don't have time to read the whole entire chapter. But let's look down at verse um, chapter 2 and verse number 23. And the Bible says, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by the reason of the bondage. And God heard uh, the side by the reason of the bondage, and they cried. Notice the word cried. I'm going to focus on that tonight. And their cry came up unto God by the reason of the bondage. Verse 24, and God heard their groaning, but could we say that would be a type of a cry? So the third time the word cry comes up, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto I'm not trying to change the words of the Bible, unto their cry or unto them. Notice, we've seen the cry four times in this passage. So we see that there was something that the children of Israel just had to get out of them, that they had to cry. The title of my message tonight is, and let me give it to you in this way, Six Principles of Crying Out Loud. Six Principles of Crying Out Loud, or the title, O oh, for Crying Out Loud. O oh, for Crying Out Loud. I'll explain that in just a moment. Lord, have, help us tonight. Help us to be simple and short and sweet. And Lord, help us, the Bible, to be sweet to us tonight as we hear it. Lord, give me grace, give me strength, give me power as I proclaim some things from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I enjoyed visiting my grandmother. She lived in Nampa, Idaho for a certain time. She went from Salt Lake City to Oakland, California, to Nampa, Idaho, and then to Cornelius, Oregon. I said, why didn't you move to Beaverton, where we lived? And she says, there's no mobile home parks, and I have a mobile home, so she's out in Cornelius. But those two times that she was in Nampa, Idaho, and Cornelius, we loved to visit grandmother. But grandmother was known for her wise, pithy sayings. I don't know if they came from World War II, if they came from the Great Depression, they came from the, the Progressive Era, but she would say sayings like this. She'd be watching a movie and something wouldn't go right or something like that. She goes, well, that went over like a lead balloon. How many of you have heard that saying before? That went over like a lead balloon. And I was a little boy and I was like, Grandma, uh, a, a, a lead balloon doesn't go anywhere. She goes, exactly, my boy, it's just the saying. And then one time, my brother and I were kind of having a squabble and fight, and she goes, I ought to hit you boys. I ought to beat you boys with a wet noodle. Oh, my goodness, grandmother, that's abuse. I'm telling my dad. Grandma, a wet noodle wouldn't hurt at all. She goes, yes, that's the point. I'm just scolding you nicely. And then my brother tipped over the candy dish one time. She had all these mints, and they went over her. And grandmother, just at her age, couldn't handle these things. And she, she came through the house one time, and she said, oh, for crying out loud. I had no idea what that meant. I know to this day it's probably some type of a euphemism for something, and uh, probably means something else than oh, for crying out loud. But as she said, oh, for crying out loud, we ducked like a grenade was going to come. We plugged our ears, and I was waiting for the cry. Well, guess what? It never came. It was silent. She went into her room, and I was like, where's the cry? So we just thought it was a funny saying. So we went home. My mom and my mom did something, and we said, oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> and uh, my mom looked at us. She goes, boys, do you know what that means? We didn't answer her. We weren't trying to be disrespectful. Oh, for crying out loud. And then she said, boys, do you know what that means? Oh, for crying out loud. We just love teasing mom. We love to do that over and over again. Oh, for crying out loud. So I guess we never really got the picture of that. But we sure appreciated grandma and her sayings. Those were fun. How many of you know some sayings that come from that era of time? And there are sayings even today. But the title comes up, Oh, for Crying Out Loud, because of the fact that when there is a cry, usually it's something that may not be so quiet. I want to talk about, first of all, the types of cries tonight. We'll go back to the passage in just a moment, because the Bible says that when they were in this period of bondage, the Bible says that they cried and their cry came up unto God by the reason of the bondage. If there was groanings, it was probably maybe down deep inside. There was some cries probably that were quiet cries, but I believe there was some, also some groanings and some sufferings and some pains that they went through. And I want to just get a picture of what are we going to do when we have the ability or do we have, the, or when there's a time in our life when we just need to cry out. There's types of cries. I've looked at emotional cries there's cries of sadness. There's cries of pain. Babies cry. Those are types of cries. There's other types of cries. They're called battle cries. In Judges chapter 7, verse 20, when they went to get up for the battle, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The first battle of Manassas Junction in civil war, a Confederate general, Bernard Elliott B. Jr., in an effort to encourage his men, he cried, there stands Jackson like a stone wall, a rally behind the Virginians. He was a cry that would encourage his men. The Texas and the Texans at the Battle of Alamo became an enduring symbol of their resistance to oppression and their struggle for independence. And thus, the battle cry of the Alamo came about. Remember the Alamo. John the Baptist was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He was crying the gospel, or he was crying the preparation of Jesus Christ. He said, make straight the way of the Lord, John 1, 23. In Acts chapter 7, there was, the, and this is talking about many cries that are in the Bible, but and many different cries, I'm not just talking about one type of cry, but the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, the men who heard Stephen's message and were frustrated and were angry that Stephen would tell the truth, they stopped their ears and they cried with a loud voice. There were cries from the crowd in Jesus' day. There were cries from the cross. There were cries from unclean spirits. And the Bible says that when we need to cry out, we cry, Abba, Father. That's a good cry. But praise Jesus, there is no crying in heaven. Because God shall wipe all tears away from their eyes. He'll wipe away all fears and build up and stresses. 
there's also cries and pleas of prayer and intercession. And I believe I'm going to direct it tonight in the next few moments to that's what they cried about there. It wasn't that they were just bent out of shape, although they were because of bondage. People in revival times, old times, would sometimes when they got right with God and they dealt with their sin, would cry out even in the midst of the service. And if the message is really terrible tonight, please don't cry out in front of me, okay? Go home and do that. Uh, Just kidding. There's also not only types of cries, but there's a reason for someone crying. There's something that causes someone to cry. It could be a burden. It could be a buildup. A cry never usually comes with a premeditated thought. You know, at 4 o'clock this afternoon, after an hour after all the students have gone home and my study hall is over, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to have a crying fit. Now, you could premeditate, and you could decide to say, we're going to cry at this time. You know, sports teams, they get together, and they're going to cry out at a certain time. But normally cry comes when there's something, nothing else you can do, and you don't know how to suppress something, and then the cry comes. Okay, the baby's hungry, the cry comes, the outburst. You ever hit your head on something and you just, it didn't really necessarily, it didn't feel so well? And you just say, oh, there, there's sometimes a just an outburst of an injury or a tragedy, and people cry out. I remember there was a funeral that... The, uh, I'm going to come back to that one later. There's the reasons for a cry. Emotions play a part. Sad, angry, happy could be a reason for someone crying. There's some injury or physical pain. And so we see that people are just maybe crying out for certain reasons. I really get kind of, I look at the extremes of people sometimes. When I see someone crying all the time, they're always crying. Or there's always something in their life. I think they're a very emotional person. I don't want to judge them, but I think there's maybe something wrong in, in their life that maybe I can be a blessing to them somehow. If I see someone that never cries ever, 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 I think they're maybe a robot, that they just don't ever, but I don't judge them at all. I just think that those are some extremes. But I believe the Lord's made, and medically speaking, it's good if we need to let something out, and there is some buildup, and there is something that's going to come out of our life or come out of our physical, it's good to just let it out. I have at times tried to hide tears because, oh, I'm embarrassed. I'm a guy. I can tell you some illustrations of one man said he just didn't want to live life anymore because his dad had a hard time showing him love. He had a hard time showing him love, and because of that, the dad was always telling him to man up. He says, well, the problem is, and I think this guy is a rustic. I mean, he builds things right now in his life. He, um, he does, he, he sings, does music. He is tremendous. He is like a, I mean, he looks like a rough guy. And I was thinking, wait a minute. He just said I was an emotional kid growing up. And so he decided not to go with a suicidal gun in his mouth one day. And I don't know all the story behind that. But he just decided that he needed to let some things out. And he said there was no one that seemed to want to listen. And then he said he got into church and got saved. And there was a family that was right there waiting for him to show him everything that he had missed in his life. That was a tremendous story that I read one day. The reasons for the cry. You know, there was a pastor one time, and his name is Gordon McDonald. He's written these books, Ordering Your Private World, Building Below the Waterline, And he said this, he said, I'm a pastor of a church. He said, one day I came home and I couldn't understand it. Let me read his account to you. And here's where people try to fight back the tears. They try to fight back the crying. They try to fight back everything, but it didn't happen. Why? Because the cry overcame them. He said it was a Saturday morning almost 25 years ago. I believe he wrote this in probably the early 2000s. I had officiated in the burial of two homeless men during the past week. In both cases, I felt their lives had been meaningless and wasted. I was overwhelmed with the sadness and emptiness of the experience. Combined with several nights of inadequate sleep, no recent spiritual refreshment, and loss of nonstop ministry activity, their deaths left me in a state of emotional overload. When I came to the breakfast table that morning, I had no clue I was on the brink of a crisis. Life had not yet prepared me for the fact that everyone has breaking points. There at the table, my point came... Uh, triggered by one innocent comment. His wife said, 
you haven't spent much time with the children lately. And she was correct. I hadn't. She had kindly avoided noting that I hadn't spent adequate time with her either. And I hadn't done any better with my Heavenly Father. Added to this was the fact that work was piling up, my sermon for the next day was unprepared, and I needed to make several hospital calls. I felt like a baseball player who just bobbled the ball, and the electronic scoreboard behind him began to flash. Error, error, error. And he said this. He said, suddenly I was engulfed with a sense of futility, and I began to cry. I lost control, and I wept steadily for four hours straight. And he was saying, he goes on to say in this book, and he goes on to say in his autobiography or one of the things he's writing, he says, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm a pastor. I'm leading the church. He said, I got my priorities straight. He said, I got some emotional things out of my, he said, I've got some, some buildup, and I started spending time with the family. He said, quality of soul became my first priority. And he went on to pastor for several more years after that. His books were excellent. There's things that, there that we can use. That was what happened to him. But he says, sometimes... There are times when you're sorting through your situation, you're sorting through what's going on in your life, and you can't figure out why you're acting the way you are. And sometimes he's saying, those are real times in your life. Notice what the children of Israel were going through. They were going through a huge transition. I like to read more about transitions because we, I have had transitions in my past life, and there's transitions that sometimes you have in your personal lives. And I'm not necessarily talking about something that's a transition here, but they had a huge transition. They were going to be coming out of Egypt, and they were going to be going into, into uh, have a new leader. Uh, Moses was a transition in his life. And if you think about all the transitions in your lives, that may cause emotions. That may cause some things where you're going to need to cry out. Well, I hope you cry out at times. I'm going to say the direction of our cry in just a moment. You don't have to just cry and complain to your neighbor. You don't have to cry to nothing, nothingness. There's places we can cry out to. I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. Other symptoms of crying. And so transitions, as I said that, I thought about this transition that they were going to go through. Many Old Testament characters went through transitions. Joshua had to transition into Moses' leadership. Many Old Testament characters, and as I was telling a young person the other day, I just said, transitions are really a part of life. They really are. And it was interesting. I'll read this probably another time, but someone back in the 1930s was talking about when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. Facetiously, he said, that Adam looked at his wife, he said, be prepared for the next transition in life. And so I was thinking about the children of Israel going through this quite a bit of a transition. But they were in bondage. Does anyone know how many years they were in bondage for? 430, approximately. That means the buildup before they cried out to the Lord Maybe they cried out for all 430 years. You're thinking about this, that if you're in halfway through that bondage, your grandchildren are still going to be in that bondage. Your grandparents have been in that bondage. This is something that's really emotional uh, on there, and they just can't handle it anymore. 430 years of bondage is probably a little bit more than the things I've had to go through in life. So I was thinking about that. Other symptoms of crying. We're still on the reason for the cry tonight. Anxiety, burnout, grief, loneliness, shame... Feeling overwhelmed and never looking like light is at the end of the tunnel. Let me tell you tonight, I won't want to sound like a discouraging message. I just want you to have a place to go and that you can go and cry tonight if you need to. And not just tears, but a crying out. There's also, what do you think the volume of the cry? That's my third point brought up. The there's types of cries. There's a reason for the cry that the children of Israel were in bondage. And their cry came up to God out of the reason of the bondage, but also the volume of the cry. This is a shorter point. But when you think about the volume of the cry, I'm thinking about different volumes here. Um, normally when you've heard cries, have you heard quiet cries? Is there cry cries down deep inside that don't even reach the surface? And those build and build and build, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a big explosion. Yeah, I've seen people like that. I'm like, oh, where... There's always something else maybe going on in somebody else's life. If they have a big explosion, it's probably there's something else on the roof. Okay? Kid's got his head down on the desk. It's not that you're teaching bad. It's that he's got something else going on in his life. So I decide in life, instead of trying to fix third-story problems, why don't we go to the root of the problems? And that takes a while sometimes in dealing with people. It really does. I'm not an expert. I'm not a psychologist. And I struggle at it all the time. But I want to always think about what builds up there. But the volumes of the cries... 
I just want to bring a quick illustration on this point and then be moving on. Normally, I think of a cry. When you think of a war cry, a rally right behind the Virginians, it's loud. It causes me to realize that when, and I've got to be careful when I say things about my family, because if I don't say it right from here, I hear about it at home. <laughs> I think I got approval on this. But there was cries in the hospital. Child number one was born. I was so excited. I didn't pace the room out in the waiting room. Oh, no, come on in. You can see the baby born. I was pacing around the bed, you know. Child number one was born, had the perfect middle cry. Wah, wah, wah. Just, just perfect. I was, oh, I was expecting every cry to be that way. The volume of the cry. Child number two was born a little bit more quickly. She wanted to be in the world right away. And the cry, I was thinking, middle cry, right? The cry was so intensely loud. Whoa! I just like, I'm, I know you're not supposed to do this to your kid, but I almost like turned to the nurse and just boom, yelled her cry. If it was a boy, I would have named it him Old Yeller. Second cry. I haven't heard that loudness in the rest of her life. She's a blessing. The third one, volume of the cry. Oh, it's got to be louder than that, man. It, this is going to be like tearing the hospital down. I am serious. I, maybe I'm exaggerating here, too, but I'm just like... But I can see the different cries and the different personalities coming through all the different cries. And that's what's really neat about, about when the Lord just, did, you know creates young ones. The third one, it was our anniversary. We were in the hospital, and that one was going to come and be born on our anniversary. And she knew it was our anniversary. So you know what the cry went like? It wasn't like, here I am, and um, I'm ruining your anniversary. No, it wasn't that. It was this. Really quiet cooing. It was the quietest cry I ever saw. I said, is that it? I didn't say that, but it's like, is that it? Because she knew that she was being born on our anniversary. And that's why the quiet was so, just wanted to be peaceful. It was so cute. It was so pleasant. I'm so, and I appreciate all three of those cries, but those are the volumes of the cries. You can go home today and you can cry on the inside quietly. Don't let it build because you may need to go speak to someone. You may need to just let it out. You may need to just, just you know, don't, don't bother the neighborhood maybe. But there are times where the volume of the cry, a lot of times I think the volume is elevated or it's something where we just cry out. I believe the groanings that the children of Israel went through were groanings and cryings and sometimes they were just in pain and they were just the volume of the cry. But I want to look at something else tonight. Look at number four, point four, and I could probably be done in the next few minutes. The direction of the cry. Notice that the Bible says in verse 23, and they cried and they cried out. They didn't necessarily cry out. Uh, notice if you could jump really quickly to Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 10. Exodus 14, 10. And the Bible says this. They did do another set of crying later on at the Red Sea. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, Exodus 14, 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out. But who did they cry out to? Unto the Lord. Go back to chapter 2 and look and says, it says, their cry came up unto God by the reason of the bondage. I believe that if I talk about the topic of prayer tonight, that's part of my message, the direction of the cry. You know, cries and complaints usually get sent to the HR department, and it's good to have an HR department. Or it gets sent to a family member, it gets sent to the neighbors, it gets sent to two people talking. Guys in the paper mill were always talking amongst themselves about how they wanted to change the company, but they really didn't go to any leadership about it. And sometimes we cry out to others and we cry out to people. And by the way, if someone is ever crying out to me, I don't tag it as complaining sometimes. I just say, hey, you need to share? Let it out. I'm, not, I'm, I'm a listener here. Now, if they came up to me every day and complained about my sports team every single day, that would be complaining. Amen? <laughs> but it was, it was something that they need to share. I never tag it as that. Because that's how the body of Christ works, where we share one with another. But 
sometimes we don't direct our cry unto the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 34, I'll just read it for the sake of time, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. He wants us to have a place to cry. He wants to be the person where we do cry, the direction of the cry. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, let us come boldly before the throne so that we can cry out. Psalm 142 verse 1, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. 142 verse 5, I cried unto the Lord and I said, sounds like a bunch of crying going on, but that's what the prayers and God wants to see the energy and the emotion in our cry. What does the Bible say as we go to James chapter 5, verse 16? The effectual crying or the effectual fervent prayer, fervent cry of a righteous man availeth much. Do we have energies in those cries? Do we have emotions in those cries? Are we working those up on purpose? Or are they just coming out because we have needs and we have a God who can answer and we have a God who can do something with it? Jeremiah 33, 3 doesn't say cry, but call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And author Robert Morgan says this. He says, some situations have offered me just two, two options. I could either panic or pray. My tendency is to panic like the Israelites by the Red Sea or the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. When we can't press forward, move sideward or step backward, it's time to look upward and to ask God to make a way. David wrote, in my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. There's crisis time prayers sometimes. But what if you're not? Mr. Uh, Brother Guru, tonight sounds like you're in an emergency. Not necessarily. Sounds like you're in a crisis or a trial. Not necessarily. The Bible says we have one that can cry out too. I'll read this quote here and then I'm going to try to wrap it up. There comes in time in spite of our soft modern ways when we must be desperate in prayer, when we must wrestle, when we must be outspoken, shameless, and importunate. Many of the prayers recorded in scriptures are cries and the Hebrew and Greek words are very strong. The Bible recognizes such a thing as storming heaven, praying through, the fervent prayer of a righteous man in its working. At times, this author says, there was little I could do except plead with God. I've gone to counsel from people in times past, and sometimes it's just like, well, you got to do what the Lord leads you to do. And I couldn't get a bent towards either way based on what someone said, so I just kept crying out to God. Did I get an answer from God? No. But he says, keep crying, keep coming. You won't have to come for 430 years. But he said, keep coming. And by the way, God didn't necessarily, he, he works in how he works. I don't know if he waited 430 years just because they didn't cry out enough. I don't think that was the case at all. You know, there is also a humility of the cry. Not only the direction of the cry, the humility of the cry. There is no cool way or professional way to cry. You know, let's just be kind of like, I just want to do this, you know, manly. Uh, let's just kind of, no, because then, then the cry, then God sees that, and it doesn't come out like the cry. It's very humbling when you have to cry. It's very humbling when you're in a dire situation, you're stressful, and so you just, you just cry out. But it humbles us, and it's what God wants to work in our lives. Now, I don't have time to get to tonight, but I was going to have another short section. I don't know if it's a whole message, but it was number six, the helper of the cry. The helper of the cry. The Bible says in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There's the types of cries tonight. There's the reasons that people build up and cry. There's the volume of the cry, the direction of the cry, the humility of the cry, and the helper of the cry. I have a few more points on the helper of the cry that I'll save for another time. But go back to Exodus chapter 2. And the Bible says in verse number 24, or verse 23, three-fourths of the way through it, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard, and God remembered, and God looked in verse 25, and God had respect unto them. And not even in that verse, reading between the lines, and God brought a Moses, a man who couldn't talk, a man who refused to talk, 
A man who, God, I don't know what you're talking about. Use that. God intervened. May we cry tonight in the right way to God. Do you have needs tonight? Well, it might be time to cry out. Keep crying. Energetic, emotional cries. Don't feel bad if you shed a tear here and there. I remember one of the greatest soul winners in all, all, a soul winner that is, and we had a cry for souls. We had a cry for revival. We had a cry for some things. We had a cry for personal needs because we need God to bless us too. Dr. Rasmussen says that out of the three greatest soul winners, one of them is a man by the name of C.W. Fisk. I don't know if he's still alive anymore. But I got to Bible college one day, and C.W. Fisk was my teacher. Whoa, I get the, one of the greatest soul winners. All I didn't hear Dr. Rasmussen say that till later. But I'd watch him walk a soul down the aisle, someone he led, led to the Lord. He'd walk him down the aisle for church attendance, and you have a tear right here. And every time, it looked like he was just, just worked up about a soul coming to Jesus. And he was a manly man. He had his cowboy boots, his southern walk, his, and his pastor to a couple different churches and then came to, to work at the college. And I looked at that and I said, there's a man that loves souls. And there's a man that cries out to the Lord when it's time to cry. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the night tonight. Thank you for your word, how the simple things stir us. God, I pray that you'd be with our invitation tonight. Lord, be with the ones who... Lord, may need to cry out to you tonight. I don't know the needs. I do know that people need to use their emotions, not necessarily to make major decisions, but to use those emotions as you've given them to them. Lord, I pray that you'd stir us tonight and work in our life. You'd convict us, Lord. You'd help us to deal with what we need to deal with. We may need to cry later. We may need to go home and, and just deal with things later. Lord, keep us close to you. And Lord, I pray that you'd continue to work in our hearts during this invitation time in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I might just ask Pastor to come and finish the invitation here tonight. Let's stand together if we could please. And as we stand, you're welcome to slip forward and pray at the front. Sit where you are. Pray. Stand where you are.